All right, this is Wednesday night at Living Word Family Church, These Final Days Ministries. I'm Pastor Ryan Speakman, and uh, the best audience in the whole world here, or congregation, or what, what do you guys call yourselves? Participant? <laughs> Peoples? Yeah. And a little bit of a smaller group tonight. What was the theory, Kim, that it's cold outside? How, how cold is it? It was 34 this morning. This morning, yeah. Right now it's maybe like 69 or something. No, no, no. no. Is it cold out there? I did, didn't even know. It's okay. But the reason I want to bring that up is because everyone watching by YouTube and Facebook is going to laugh at us because they're like in Minnesota or, you know, the actual cold places. Yeah, so. so uh, melting in Florida. Yeah, it's, I guess they're having a. Oh, okay. So we, we switched for a change. Um, I almost forgot to mention serving under my favorite pastor in the whole world, Pastor Maureen Collins. Yeah. We love our pastor. So, And I already announced in here, I'll say it again for the camera, just so my Facebook people don't get completely shocked, which they wouldn't, if they even notice, but we'll be moving next class into a classroom setting. So that's going to be a lot of fun, more, more uh, intimate environment in there. So a um, little bit of a shorter class tonight, just because we're over time. But uh, we're going to dive right in. So uh, I, I think I'm missing a couple of the people who were here um, last time we were here, which was, wasn't it two weeks ago? Yeah, yeah two weeks ago, uh, where we had the little debate, quote unquote, about the, the, the Temple Mount and the true location of the Temple. And, I, and believe me, I'm, I'm totally willing to drop that, but, I, but we were having fun with it. And we all talked after class. And that's why I love my class, because... None of us agree about probably anything, but we have a great time talking. <laughs> but I, right, but I did promise that I would show you guys uh, the point that I was making about um, what the inside of the Temple Mount really looks like. So I did take the time to uh, put this together. I even spent my own money on this because to get the, uh, the, the, a good uh, copy of this image, um, it's $5 at uh, Lean Rittmeyer's archaeological you know, website. Because they're selling directly to colleges and universities and, and things like that, so, I, so five bucks it cost me. So you guys better appreciate this, okay? <laughs> and I donated it to these Final Days Ministries. So, um, so uh, what I'm going to start with, though, and again, this is just because I promise you guys, and we'll do this real quick. I want to get into our uh, study here tonight. Elijah, please put up uh, slide number 68. So I just grabbed this today off of uh, Bob Cornuck's um, video on the Temple Mount, and I'm sure he, had, he may have this image on his website, uh, whatever books he's published or whatever, but um, so this is, this is an image off of the video that talks about uh, uh, what Bob Cornuck proposes as the actual site of the first and second temple, so as we talked about last week, and he's not the only one. I, when I was looking for this on YouTube, I saw there's quite a few teachers that are, that are teaching this, okay? Um, I, he may have been the original one or something, but, but uh, this is what's called the, uh, do you guys know what this is called? Yeah, so this is the City of David. This is actually an uh, archaeological site that's in the uh, Palestinian neighbor, neighborhood of Silwan, and uh, it is just south of, uh, of the Temple Mount. Let me use that phrase, okay? <laughs> so this is the, uh, this, the, the uh, old city wall that's approximately right here and goes around. And, uh, and I have been to this, uh, this site. Uh, we have friends who just came back a week or so ago, uh, and they visited the City of David. So you can actually go there now and, uh, and, and explore this entire uh, site. Um, there, there's, there's a really special feature here that's underground. Does anyone know off the top of your head what it is? It's, it's a pretty famous thing. It's, it's uh, from the story of the... Uh, uh, that's actually down here, okay? But, um, but it's related to that, so... Uh, it's, it's related, but, but during the, the time of the Assyrian siege where the, where the Assyrians came in and they, and, they, and they conquered the northern kingdom of Hezekiah's Tunnel. Very good. See, I just had to give you a couple hints. So that runs along here. And um, is anyone here claustrophobic? Okay. Is it, let me, actually, let me, let me rephrase. Is anyone here not claustrophobic? Okay, because I would say yes. Do Hezekiah's Tunnel, and you will be. I shouldn't pronounce it on you because that's a <laughs> man. It's about 1,500 feet long, but when I was in there, it was just bumper to bumper people and getting kind of stuffy in there, and you're way underground, and you're walking through about uh, two feet of water, maybe even three feet at points, um, and it just yeah, just boy, the tunnel just goes on and on and on. But anyways, that's that's one feature here. Now, um, only in recent years 
have they begun to excavate uh, where uh, Bob and some of the other teachers uh, proposed would have been the site of the temples. Uh, and, but what they have found there, and I, and I saw it myself, I went underground, we walked around the whole area here, um, uh, there is no hint of a temple there of any kind. Uh, what they think was here was actually King David's palace, and they've excavated rooms and walls and artifacts, and uh, uh, it's actually a very famous um, discovery. I, I should have made a note of it. It, it was a, a woman archaeologist uh, just within the, about the last 10 years who, uh, who made the discovery, and they just opened up recently for um, tourists. So uh, you could actually go and see for yourself. Um, I mean, no, there's not one archaeologist, anyone who says, oh, look, this is where the temple was. It, it's King David's palace. At, at, at best, there's even some archaeologists who say, no, it's just regular housing, you know, residential. No hint of a temple there at all. Um, but, but that said, so, so what um, Bob and the other teachers are proposing is that this is where the temple was, even though there's no, no archaeological hint of one there. And then up here, what, what does Bob propose that this was? And I'm doing this all respectfully, more out of respect for the people who, you know, listen to the teachings and, and consider it. I don't want to come across as a jerk. Do I ever come across as a jerk? Really? Oh, I, was, I almost said don't answer that. Huh? Passionate, not a jerk. Passionate, but not a jerk. Hey, I'll take that. So what, what, is, what is the theory here, the idea? What, what would this have been then? Yeah, the, the, the Antonio Fortress is what it's called, which was the Roman uh, fortress. Uh, okay, um, and, uh, and so this is how he proposes that it would have been laid out. You know, four basic walls with uh, four little, you know, towers here, guard towers. And then, uh, yeah, so then w within these, these walls, and, and what are all these uh, buildings sitting on? You can see it real plainly, according to this depiction. Uh, it's the troops' places, their horses, and all of that. But they're, but they're just camped out on the ground, right? Yeah. There's, no, there's no special footing or foundation or anything. And, and that's, that's, how, that's how Romans did their, their camps, their huge camps, when they had a, a garrison or, or, or a legion camped out. They just, they just, you know, place their buildings right there on the ground. So, uh, so according to this, you could see, you know, flat ground within these four walls, right? Uh, go to the next slide, Elijah. I think it's slide 69. Yeah, there we go. So there's a close-up of it. And sure enough, that's what it says, Fort Antonia. Okay. And uh, here again, we just see it closer. So four, four walls, simple walls, towers, and kind of a more or less flat ground within the walls. And here's the tents and everything. Good? Next slide. <laughs> this is what I paid $5 for. This is based on sonar and radar and actually going underground. Uh, this is the equivalent of the United States Geological Survey. Uh, this is just a survey of the topography of, of this area. Um, there's no conspiracy behind this. There's no conjecture. No one's trying to just in fact, all this was done before Bob Cornick, back when he was still a cop, <laughs> before he ever even started to, you know, come up with his theory about the location of the Temple Mount. This, this work was all done back in the, uh, the, the 1970s, uh, maybe into the early 1980s. But what do you see that's funny here? It doesn't look anything like Bob's depiction of the Temple Mount, right? Yeah. This is reality, you guys. This is what's actually inside the... And I have a book called The Quest. It's about that thick, and it's full of not, not diagrams. There's some diagrams in there, like this illustration's in there, but actual photographs where Lean Rittmeyer and his team, uh, for 22 years between the years 1967 and 1981, were allowed, and they spent every day doing archaeology um, in and on and around the Temple Mount. And these guys were in these tunnels. They were in these antechambers. Uh, they got into some of these areas here. They weren't able to get right around here because what, what is Sakra? Does anyone know what this is? Does, does anyone know what this word means in Arabic? Come on, all you scholars. It means the rock. <laughs> what, now, what, what's the most famous structure on the Jerusalem skyline? The Dome of the Rock. Well, this is the rock. That, that, that's the Arabic word for rock, Sakra. This is the peak of a mountain that we know as, well, Mount starts with an M, Moriah. This is, this is the peak of Mount Moriah, okay? 
Uh, but this is what's actually inside the Temple Mount. If you look at it, it's, it's rock. It's ma- there's a mountain inside there. It's not flat. It's not a flat dirt surface, surf, surface where you could put a bunch of you know, tents and horses and things like that. It, it, it just isn't like that. We, we could do all the artist depictions that we want, but, but it's not reality. This is what the reality is. So, so I don't see how we could fit, you know, it, there's a mountain in there. You, you just can't. We also start to see some other things. So here, I've actually seen this, okay, Vernon too. You, you can ask Vernon about this. The Western Wall Tunnel, uh, which, which just opened up in the, in the early 1980s. I, actually, I'm sorry, it was the 1990s. It skirts along the whole base of the Temple Mount. And Vernon and I, we started uh, probably, let's see, there's probably right about this point here, you go underground. This is, this is the Western Wall, or what they used to call the Whaling Wall, is right at this spot here. And then here's the ramp, that, that wooden ramp that you guys have seen. I'm showing you pictures that goes up onto the Temple Mount today. But the uh, Western Wall Tunnel starts about here, and it goes all along the base of the Temple Mount. And some of those rocks, there, there's one rock that's uh, 43 feet long. Yeah, weighs, weighs um, dozens and dozens of tons. They, and they're not even 100% sure how the, how, how the workers actually moved it. Um, the Romans just didn't go into that much engineering for anything they did. I mean, I mean, hopefully we're already way past that whole point. But, but you know, walking along here, um, Vernon and I, we actually got all the way to the Struthian Pool. I've been there a couple times. So, so we've gotten that far along. When you're at this point here, there, there are the ruins of the Antonia Fortress, okay, right at the base of the wall. And the reason that this fortress is so small, of course this fortress could not house 30,000 troops, all right? Those troops were, were camped uh, just a couple miles north of Jerusalem, up near modern-day Ramallah, in a town called Jifna, where Vernon and I stayed for a couple of days. We spent the night in Jifna. And I told you guys this last time, standing up on the, the roof of the house, we're looking down on Roman ruins, and it was the, the, the camp of, of uh, the, the uh, Roman legion, the 10th Roman legion. So they were camped up here. So, at, you know, at a moment's notice, they could all be called down here to do whatever they need to do in Jerusalem, which happened in the year AD 70. That's when they came down and, and killed a million Jews and and destroyed the temple and all that. But the fortress was just, you know, that's where, okay, you're on duty, you have to spend a couple days at the fortress looking down over the temple mount, but the ruins are right there. I know that, um, oh, and by the way, see these weird structures here? These are all interior to the temple mount. When you walk up on the temple mount today, you actually see these, they're all capped off now, but these are cisterns. So these are are, uh, holding tanks for water so there was no shortage of water up on top of the Temple Mount. And, but it, the, the, uh, there's nothing in Scripture that says that the Temple Mount was fed by the Gihon Spring. Okay, but, but if you look up here, uh, here's the Pool of Bethesda, and then that spills into what's called the Pool of Israel. Same thing. This is right by what's uh, called today uh, the Lion's Gate. Um, the Via Dolorosa runs uh, right along here, right along the side of it, the, the ruins, the remains of the pool are still there. There was a huge pool at the northern end of the Temple Mount that was a little bit elevated above the Temple Mount. Whatever water they needed, it, would, it, it came from the pool. Didn't they just find that What's that? Didn't they just find that the, the pool's there, yeah. Huge, huge pool that would collect water from whatever spring fed the pool of Bethesda. So, um, so hopefully you can see it now. I mean, you know, I, I could show you photographs inside. These are called the Hulda Gates. This is at the southern... Southern Wall archaeological site. I've been to these gates. This is the triple gate, the double gate. They're both sealed off now. The Muslims sealed those off centuries ago, okay, because because they're trying to erase any Jewish presence on the Temple Mount. They're telling the same story. Oh, the Jews were never up here. There was never a temple here. So they probably love the story that they're hearing, but but they're they're trying to rewrite history. But um, I could show you photographs in here. It's, it's very elaborate uh, decor, and it's, it's Herodian style. Um, it's, it's nothing that you'd ever see inside of a Roman fortress. I mean, we're talking about beautiful marble pillars with caps that are extremely ornate and, and dome uh, ceilings that have uh, murals on them, and it all matches like what, what we see in other Herodian architecture around Israel, like his palace in Caesarea, uh, Masada. So, um, so it just... You know, th- these are the facts. It's kind of indisputable. So, ho- hope that helps you guys. Just food for thought. I always say, tell you guys in here, not my job to change anyone's mind about anything. But interesting, though, right? 
Okay, you want to move on? Okay, so food for thought. Think about it. And I'll send you guys these pictures if you want me to. Just let me know. So, so with that, we have 10 minutes on the clock. Should we get to our study? <laughs> Isn't this fun, though? I love this. Yeah, just we have, we, have, we have a ton of variety in here. Boy, that's for sure. Never run out of material. Almost six years, and I haven't even hardly scratched the surface of, you know. All right, so do you guys happen to remember what we've been talking about recently in the class? about the Jewishness of the Antichrist. Okay, so we're, we're trying to understand um, his identity, who he is, and this all, this all came about uh, as, as we started to explore, you know, hey, is there a difference between the, 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 the uh, so-called Prince of the Covenant, uh, you know, who Daniel calls the Prince of the Covenant, the person who is going to broker the seven-year peace treaty that, that defines the seven-year Great Tribulation, is that, is that a different person than the Antichrist? And then from there, I just started to get into, you know, more deeper study. What does Daniel actually say about the Antichrist? Because, hey, we're here. Let's do it. Um, for me, um, uh, probably the main way that I gauge uh, what direction we head in this class is if something excites me and stirs me up and is interesting to me. So, uh, so, so, so thanks for, you know, following with me here. So um, interesting stuff, right? We need to know our enemies. So. And the word tells us very much about him. Let's see what the word says. So uh, we saw a couple, or yeah, I think it was a couple of classes ago when we actually looked at it. But, um, but uh, scripture actually tells us pretty clearly that the Antichrist will be Jewish. A lot of people uh, debate that and disagree with that. But uh, we know that Irenaeus says in no uncertain terms that the, that the uh, Antichrist will come from a particular Jewish tribe. Do you guys remember what that is? The tribe of Dan, which is why Dan is not... Uh, counted among the tribes of Israel in the book of Revelation, Irenaeus says. But Irenaeus, he wasn't just kind of like pulling that out of thin air. He was quoting an Old Testament prophet. You guys remember? The prophet Jeremiah. Okay. So uh, he was actually quoting Jeremiah when he said, this guy's going to come from the tribe of Dan. And then even in the very passage that we're kind of centered on with, with, with all this, which is uh, the book of Daniel, Daniel chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12, uh, even in there, uh, Daniel gives us a very strong clue that, in fact, the Antichrist is Jewish. He's, he, he will be Jewish or is Jewish. I believe he's alive today. Um, I don't know if you guys recall that. It was where uh, Daniel talks about um, he won't regard, remember, the God of his fathers, the desire of women, which, which we studied that, and that seems to mean the Messiah, Jesus, or any other God. He exalts himself above them all. Anytime we see the phrase uh, God of his fathers or God of their fathers, the fathers are always Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, who was renamed Israel, it always refers to Jews. Okay, so, so the God of his fathers implies extremely strongly that the, that the Antichrist will be Jewish. So uh, we started to look uh, in the last class uh, at this question, well, what about the Jews themselves? You know, that gets ignored so much in the body of Christ I kind of understand why, but I think it's it's very poor scholarship. I did it myself for a while. I, I was trying to figure all this stuff out, and this was years and years and years ago, before before my first trip to Israel. And it occurred to me one day, why don't I just try to get in touch with some rabbi somewhere and see if he'll answer my questions, and that and look where I am now. I mean, that started this whole chain of events. Where now, you know, now we've got a mutual friend that you guys are all friends with, who's been here several times who's an Orthodox Jew coming here to speak in our church. I mean, God is so good. You know, if, if, if we seek it, he'll, he'll, he'll reveal it to us. He'll give it to us. So, um, so I think, I think we've got the right idea. Uh, uh, it, it's great to study all this stuff just in a Christian perspective. We need to, but then, you know, let's also see what the Jews think because that could really shed some light on, Hey, uh, so, so, uh, who are the Jews expecting? So, so there's this, there's this idea that, uh, that when the Antichrist comes, and this is so offensive to my Jewish friends, and I can't help it, tried to get away from it, I can't. Uh, according to uh, Scripture, even Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, the Bible that the Jews use, um, uh, that w when, when the Antichrist comes, the Jews will receive him as their Messiah. Okay, So, uh, so th that begs a, a very important question then. Who are the Jews expecting in their Messiah? Uh, and if we can answer that, that can give us tremendous, that can shed tremendous light on who the Antichrist is. Does that make sense? Who, who are, you know, it's not just going to be Michael York, 
you know, right? Like, like in the, what's, what was the old movie? I always forget the Omega Code or something. Okay, he, he can't just show up and say, hey, I'm your Messiah. Um, even, even President Trump or President Obama, I remember for the longest time, everybody was saying he's the Antichrist. Obama couldn't have just flown to Jerusalem and said, oh, I, uh, I'm going to be your Messiah. Listen, you're not going to be received as the Jewish Messiah unless the Jews say you are the Messiah. So the Antichrist needs to be very clever, very cunning, very highly skilled in his deceit, and we know that he will be, uh, to be able to pull this off. Um, so who are they looking for? Watch this. So uh, put up slide number uh, 67. This is what got us going in this direction, the Bob Cornick direction last time. So uh, you guys probably all recognize this gentleman by now. I talk about him all the time. I interviewed him in 2012. Super, super great guy. And then uh, when Vernon and I were there in 2014, he, he I, I thought he forgot I even existed, but he actually comped us to go into his uh, new uh, temp, um, temple. Uh, come on, Ryan, the Temple Institute facility, right? So really nice guy. Uh, um, every, every Jew that I know, Rabbi Richman, uh, Gershon Solomon, Rabbi Rosenbaum, who was here, Noam, all right? Uh, there, there's, there's specific details about uh, the Messiah that they're, that they're watching for. First and foremost, what, what is it that the Messiah, when he comes, this is the Jewish perspective, will do? What's that building behind Rabbi Richman there in the picture? He'll build the temple, okay? Now, um, Rabbi Richman actually has a different spin on this. Uh, he, he has been to the United States many times. In the last few years, he names his tour the same thing. Uh, he, he calls it, if you build it, he will come. Okay, so Rabbi Richman, he's devoted his life and done a tremendous job. Listen, the Temple Institute will be directly involved in the rebuilding of the temple, no question about it. They, they've, you know, they're the ones who put together all the instruments, all the priestly garments. They've trained priests. They've been practicing the, uh, the rituals that take place on the Temple Mount. I mean, they have everything ready that they can have ready. There's a few things that they can't yet. We talked about that, I think, a couple weeks ago. There's a few things that they can't, uh, they can't do uh, themselves. Um, they can't create the Ark of the Covenant. There's one Ark. It can't be re reproduced. Uh, they're going to have to retrieve the Ark, you know, when the time comes. Um, they can't test the 12th ingredient for the incense until it's time to actually use it. Uh, the red heifer is another one we talked about, right? Um, they're waiting for the red heifer to appear. But every, pretty much everything else, they've got ready to go, you know, for the temple. So, But um, it's, it's interesting. So Rabbi Richman, of course, that's his life. His entire life's purpose is to rebuild the temple. So, so he's, he's arguing, and he makes a good argument. You know, let's not, let's, let's not wait until Messiah shows up to build the temple, We'll build it, and if we build it in response to that, Messiah will come. And he's got some scripture to back him up on that. And what's funny is that Rabbi Richman actually, uh, as it turns out, is the one who's right. Not at all in the way that he thinks right now, believe me, <laughs> okay? Because he's a Jew through and through, meaning he, he's not a Christian. He doesn't recognize Jesus as a Messiah yet, okay? But, um, but this actually is how the story is going to play out. The temple is going to be rebuilt. And then three and a half years after its dedication, that's when the true Messiah will show up. So Rabbi Richman is right. Again, not quite in the way that he's thinking right now. But, uh, but, uh, but again, this is, this is a, a, just a critical key component. Um, Messiah is Messiah because he builds the temple, okay? Uh, what else? Uh, go to slide number 47, please. Okay. So this is off of uh, the website Chabad.org. Uh, do you guys, are you familiar with that organization, Chabad? They're all over the place. Noam and I met with the Chabad house up in uh, Flagstaff. Um, Vernon and I had Shabbat dinner one night at the Chabad house right by the Western Wall. But it's a worldwide organization. But uh, they're huge on um, uh, Jewish scholarship. Uh, they're considered an extremely reliable source, right? And this is basic stuff anyways, but uh, you, I know you can't read that on the screen. I just want to show you where I got this information, but here's what it says there. Uh, again, assuming you can't read it, it says, the term Mashiach, unqualified, always refers to Mashiach ben David, which means what? Yeah, Mashiach, the son of David, or, or more precisely, the descendant of David. Now, is that true about Messiah? Yeah. Yeah, we know, we know that because we know who the Messiah is, and that's, that's Yeshua, Jesus, uh, who, in fact, comes from the line of David uh, of the tribe of Judah. So we know that that, that is correct. The Jews are expecting the same thing. Um, 
He is the actual, final redeemer who shall rule in the messianic age. We agree with that, right? We call it the millennial reign. Okay, they call it the messianic age. Uh, all that was said in our text relates to him. So this is, a, this is another thing they're expecting uh, of, the, of the tribe of Judah, of the line of David. More broadly speaking, he's Jewish, okay? Uh, the, the, um, the Jews are not going to receive or accept anyone who is not Jewish, period. So, so if Daniel is right about who the Antichrist is and he comes from the north, he comes from the area around Syria, Lebanon, uh, and I've heard that said, the Antichrist will be Syrian. He, he'll, he may have some Syrian blood. He probably will because it's all mixed now. But, um, but he has to be Jewish in order for the Jews to, to receive him and accept him as their Messiah. And they have to. That's a key part of the story. Let's look at uh, uh, Irenaeus again. We're going to look at uh, another of his contributions here. Slide number 23, Elijah. You have to go back a little bit. And then, uh, and then I'm going to have to close here. I'm doing my thing again, going over by a couple minutes. Sorry, Pam and Ron and Elijah. <laughs> you guys good? Okay, so here's what Irenaeus says here. We know that Irenaeus was the protege of Polycarp, whose mentor was none other than John the Apostle himself, who wrote the book of Revelation. This is why we like Irenaeus, why I consider him the most credible writer outside the Bible itself. Personally, I, 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 think, I really think he is. Uh, the Lord, here's what he writes. He writes... The Lord also spoke as follows, meaning Jesus, to those who did not believe in him. I, and here he's quoting the book of John. So this is just Irenaeus quoting scripture that we know. Then he interprets it for us. Jesus said, you guys remember this, I have come in my father's name and you have not received me. When another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. If you guys all heard that before, that's John 5.43. Here's what Irenaeus goes on to say, calling the Antichrist the other because he is alienated from the Lord. So Irenaeus right here tells us that, uh, that, that who Jesus is referring to there is, is the Antichrist, okay? So, so here's the tricky part, all right? This is, this is where it gets challenging for us. Uh, the, Jews, the Jews do receive the Antichrist as their Messiah. I mean, I mean, Irenaeus makes it plain, and he's quoting Jesus. Jesus makes it plain uh, that the Antichrist will be received, by them as, as Mashiach, as Messiah, uh, at least in the beginning, right, until the abomination of desolation takes place. But uh, here's the question, and then we're going to answer this next week, and it's interesting, okay, because i, I got to be able to back this up somehow. Um, how can the Antichrist be from the tribe of Dan, that's according to Irenaeus and Jeremiah, if the Jews are expecting an, uh, their Messiah to be from the tribe of Judah? Now we got these three puzzle pieces that don't fit. Okay, Jesus says that the Jews are going to accept the, the Antichrist as their Messiah, but the Jews say the Messiah has to be from the tribe of Judah, which we know is true from Scripture, and yet, according to Irenaeus and Jeremiah, the Antichrist is not from the tribe of Judah, but from the tribe of, Je of Dan. doesn't fit. So here we go. The Bible's contradicting itself, and see, it doesn't make sense. You guys think that's true? Because the Bible doesn't contradict itself, and true teachers of the word don't contradict Scripture. So, so something's funny here. How do we solve this problem? The, the, the Jews are expecting tribe of Judah, Antichrist, the tribe of Dan. How can that be? There's a really simple solution to this. Huh? Okay, I'll give you a gold star for that because that's actually like first point on my list. <laughs> Did you hear what Gina said? No. It's just so basic. You know, we don't have to complicate this stuff even as much as I love to. Yeah, <laughs> Keith laughs. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. It's my favorite thing. Um, he's going to lie to them. He's going to deceive them. But, 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 won't, but couldn't they test it? Wouldn't they be able to figure it out? I mean, okay, and we're going to talk about that next week. We're going to get into a little bit of science, very simple stuff. No, not next week. It'll be the week after, and bonus, there will be coffee and cookies when we talk about this. Isn't that cool? So, yeah, so, so even more fun than usual. So, all right, I'm going to close right there. Everybody good? You guys were kind of quiet tonight. Which, which means I get to talk more, which I'm not going to complain about, you know. <laughs> but any, any final comments or questions or... Um, you know, and if you guys, uh, you can see, you could see like how much fun I have with, um, 
with 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 challenges and 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 even what we could you know safely call disagreements or whatever. Anytime you guys want to talk about any particular point in here, want me to back up something uh, that that you're not quite sure about, I'll, I'll squeeze it in. Go ahead, Gina. The, you had the Mount Moriah, right? Yes. Okay. That's what's inside the Temple Mount, right? So what is Mount Zion? I know the Bible says that the Temple was on Mount Zion. So is yeah. Mount Zion the same as Mount Moriah? Uh, it, well, now listen, this is what's interesting, okay? Um, Vernon and I went on Mount Zion. Mount Zion is actually... Um, hey, Ron, Elijah, do you mind if we take one more minute here? Okay, uh, Elijah, put up that slide again that we showed, the, um, the, the topographical diagram of the Temple Mount, and I'm going to show you, Vern and I went on Mount Zion, that's where the, um, uh, there's, a, there's, a Catholic, there's a huge Catholic um, convent there, beautiful, I, I can't even think of the name of it, somebody brought this up the other day to me, Domitian Abbey, Dormition Abbey, Dormition Abbey it's called, uh, and that's right next to the Diaspora Yeshiva, which happens to be the school where Rabbi Rosenbaum, you guys all know Rabbi, that's where he got his smicha, that's where he studied, what's that? Well, no, it's it's there. What what they call Mount Zion today is actually located. Where are we? Right about here. Okay. Now the city of David's way over here. Uh, Mount Zion is exactly. Wait a minute. I'm looking at the wrong spot. I'm sorry. No, no. I'm I'm nowhere near it. This is the wrong place. But just leave that up. So it's actually the old city wall goes along here. The city of David is way over here. Okay. And Mount Zion would be way over here at the other corner, it's the southwest corner of the old city, not the Temple Mount, but the old city, yeah, city and it's a little hill. On Mount Zion. No, City of David is nowhere near what is today called Mount Zion. Well, yeah, yeah. Because they, they changed. Right, but, but back in the day, Mount Zion is just another name for Mount Moriah. So this, back in the, in the time of King Solomon and King Herod, this is, this is Mount Zion. City of David, Mount Zion. City, city, city of David. Yeah, city, City of David, trust me, you can look on any map from any period throughout human history. So that's the city, city, of David? city of David's never been referred to as Mount Zion. City, city it never has been. City of da it's true. City, city of David is over here, and Mount and little Mount Zion is here, but but this is what Mount Zion's referred to, Mount Moriah. Uh, okay, and you could show me otherwise if you. Well, show, show me the scriptures, and we'll, we'll look at it. But, okay. but in scripture, in, in, in the Bible, when it talks about Mount Zion, it's, it's the same as Mount Moriah. So if this is Mount Moriah, that's Mount Zion. Uh, the modern-day Mount Zion is just something they came up with later. And it's a nice little hill, but it's, it's a completely different location. It's nearby, but okay. Um, but yeah, let's talk more. Challenge me more, email me, call me, whatever. We'll do Starbucks. Okay, I'm going to close in prayer. Father God, we uh, thank you for tonight, Father God. Just thank you for your presence here. I just thank you for uh, this group of people, Lord, um, that, they're, that they're full of wisdom and knowledge and understanding and full of your Holy Spirit. Father God, I thank you for the uh, curiosity that you have placed inside all of us and that you stoke like a fire in us, Father God, because you know that our hearts are to learn more and understand more, get to know you better, know your word better. And Father, uh, we just want to be prepared for what's coming, and, and uh, we are ready, Father God, to usher in your son's uh, soon return to this earth, Father God. And uh, like we always pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. I thank you for anointing us for that, Father, for, for uh, what this generation has been, has been born to, uh, to witness and be part of. I uh, ask you to uh, bless this church, bless our pastor, Pastor Marine the other uh, pastors and leaders in Lake Havasu, our friends at the synagogue, Father God. We pray for uh, Noam and Adi and our other friends in Israel, Father. We just, uh, the, the conflict over there, Father, we just pray for peace in the Holy Land. We pray for safe journey for them when they come to visit us in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in uh, Lake Havasu City next month, Father God, and just help us to prepare for that time, Father, just to be a blessing to them and a light to them, Father, when they come. And uh, Lord, I just ask you to bless each one here with uh, prosperity, increase, long life, divine health, and love, joy, and peace, and bless them as they go. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thanks, you guys. So we'll see you in two weeks where they, we have cookies and coffee. Yay. <laughs>